The Phileas Club is supported entirely by its listeners at patreon.com slash the Phileas Club. If you enjoy the show, please do consider joining them. That would be awesome. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Phileas Club. This is episode 108 for April 2018, and we have people from France, from Ireland, from Saudi Arabia, and from Germany. Let's do it. everyone and welcome back to the Phileas Club. This is a show where we cover the news from the past month from around the world and the way we do this is a little bit different from what you might have in other news podcasts. We get people from different parts of the world and we ask them to tell us what's been making the news, what's been important in their country over the past month and we get different looks, different angles on uh, news stories, sometimes the same ones, sometimes different ones and we then discuss all of that and how we see it. I'm Patrick Beja and I am from France slash more and more time spent in Finland these days, especially since I just had a, a baby a few months ago and now I've moved to the Finnish countryside. We've, uh, we're getting uh, to the point where the house is basically kind of acceptably livable. Uh, I was going to say the new house, but really it's a very old house that's not in great shape. So that's all kinds of fun uh, with a three months old baby. Um, and today I have a, a three wonderful co-hosts to accompany me on this journey. First, of course, as always, Turkey is joining us. How's it going, Turkey? Hey, Patrick, all is good. Uh, now we have movies, so everything is good here in Saudi. We're done. That's, so I will get to that, I'm sure. We'll get to two things, I'm sure, at least in your section. Uh, first, uh, can women see Avengers Infinity War? That's going to be my first yes. question. <laughs> okay, And then uh, you're going to be doing a, a weather section because apparently you're getting uh, into the world of Mad Max Fury Road in uh, in Saudi Arabia, or at least in Riyadh. Yes, lovely, lovely, lovely weather. So that's going to be cool. Uh, or, or cool. I mean, interesting. I'm not going to rejoice <laughs> from this. Uh, we also have Bart, who's back from Ireland. We had a couple of shows together, including one special where we talked about Ireland only. And it was one of the most interesting episodes we've ever done on this show. I think it was from a few months ago. And if you haven't listened to it go check it out it is episode number i, I don't know i'll check now <laughs> and, and tell you in a second uh when i find this episode number which no doubt uh is episode 96 so go check that out how's it going bart it is going very well patrick um I, i'm glad that people enjoy the Ireland show it was so much fun recording it with you and I haven't been on in a while, so I wanted to say really well done on the Belgian show, because that was a oh. hard one to do. And so I'm, as the surname suggests, I'm actually Flemish-Belgian originally. <laughs> and given how fractious our little country is, I thought you did really well. But I think you need a Flemish person at some stage, because... <laughs> well, no, like, I mean... No, you, I agree, I agree. Your Wallonian guest was amazingly good at saying when he was speaking from a Wallonian point of view and what he uh -huh. thought a Flemish point of view was. And I, I think it would be really fun to do the mirror image if you can find someone Flemish who is equally as fair-minded as, <laughs> you know, the, the Wallonian you found. So I thought it was an amazing show because I was a bit apprehensive. I was like, uh -huh. oh, that's a minefield he's stepping into. But yeah, I know. You did it great. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, maybe at some point we'll do uh, the, the mirror episode, the companion episode to that uh, episode, which was episode 102. Um, so we'll do that at some point. Maybe, I mean, you're more Irish than, uh, uh, than Flemish these days. Aren't yeah, you? I mean, I was four years old when we left. And while right, I go right. back for holidays, what I see is Belgium at Christmas time. And it's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of a small subset of Belgium most of the time. And yes, I do read some Belgian newspapers to keep up with how insane right, our politics right. is. And if, well, if it's that, not the same, yeah. If if that doesn't, if don't you don't really understand why uh, this is, was such a minefield, go listen to that special, uh, the one about the kingdom of Belgium, because it's a kingdom, obviously. Yes. That was uh, episode one hundred two. And, and my favorite piece of trivia, Patrick, because you mentioned yes. the Kingdom of Belgium. Belgium is the only popular monarchy left in the world. He is not the king of Belgium. 
He is the king of the Belgians. Mm. And he does not rule by divine right. He rules by consent. So, yeah, I think we addressed this a little bit. What happens if there isn't a consent anymore? But apparently they don't really we have We fire that, uh, him. Yeah. I mean, it happened once. Um, and he swears an oath of allegiance to the constitution. So there's no God mentioned when a new king is sworn in. He swears to the Belgian constitution. Excellent. That sounds like the right way of doing it. Or, I don't know, it's been working out for the past, you know, 100 or 150 years in the world, that way of doing it. But maybe it's a blip and really it's not the right way of doing it and we should go back to the olden ways. Well, you know, w once the uh, sandstorm of oblivion that is engulfing Saudi Arabia and soon the world has done uh, de de <laughs> its devastation, maybe we'll go back to uh, the other ways. Um, we also have Oliver, uh, first time joining us. Uh, Oliver is from Germany and a tiny little bit of Austria now, but mainly Germany. How's it going, Oliver? Oh, thank you. I'm doing fine. And uh, life is good. <laughs> wow. So much positivity today. Everyone's kind of seems kind of happy. That doesn't happen all the time on this show. Uh, but I'm sure we'll bring the uh, mood down uh, throughout the show. I'm certain we'll have opportunities. Uh, since you're the uh, first timer, Oliver, can you tell us a, a couple of things about yourself so the listeners know uh, what to expect or at least where you're coming from? Yeah, so um, I run a software company called Boeing Software. We make photo and video apps on the uh, app for the Apple universe, um, Macs, iPhones, iPads, Apple TV. Um, I live in uh, Munich, Germany, where I was born and raised. And so I've spent uh, you know, most of my time here. Uh, now I get to spend more and more time in Salzburg, uh, which is at the border between Bavaria and Austria. Uh, nice little city um, known for Mozart and uh, classical music. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I got introduced to um, to the Phileas Club um, by Alison uh, yeah. Sheldon for, uh, of Pot, Alison, uh, Potfeed. Of Potfeed, and, yeah. We've had her on the show uh, specifically yeah. on the, uh, I think maybe a couple, but at least the one about uh, life as a woman, which I would also recommend you go check out that's a lot of episodes to check out um and actually she introduced me to bart as well so i was it's just gonna say special <laughs> okay yeah um and, and she she recommended that i listen to the show and then she thought it would be fun if i um joined and and uh, provided my point of view um and um now here i am and um you know, yeah. looking forward to looking forward to participating. Well, so are we. Uh, I, I'm sure it's going to be an interesting one. It's a fun group we have today. So, uh, oh, and that special is episode 98. So now you have 97, uh, 96, 98, and uh, 102 to listen to. Go back in the archives. All of them are, are available on the RSS feed. So go check them out. Um, thanks, Oliver, for joining us, and thanks uh, to everyone for joining us. Let's get started and i think i'm gonna i'm gonna lead the charge here because i think i have a, a pretty interesting story about what's been happening in france over the last few weeks um there's a lot that has been happening and of course everyone reported on what's happening in the us and everyone's reported what's happening uh, on what's happening in korea with the historic summit between the north and south and all of those uh more importantly, though, for our country, uh, there have been a lot of strikes and demonstrations. Um, and I could cover that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to cover something that I think you'll tell me if I'm wrong or right, but I think is going to be even more um, interesting slash strange to the rest of the world. Um, Quick note, the strikes and demonstrations are about uh, uh, the reform of the railway system and the m monopoly that the state company has over the railway uh, system mainly and the status of the railway workers, be they uh, drivers, you know, uh, uh, train drivers. Is that the word in English, drivers for train? It is, yeah. Okay, there you go. We have a special one in French. Um so train drivers and uh, uh, the, j the whole thing basically would be open to competition and the status of new hires would change because now they have uh, what con many French people consider privileges that they sh probably shouldn't have, should be aligned to what other workers uh, have. 
and I'm trying to remain neutral in the description here, uh, and they are doing rolling strikes, which are strikes for two or three days a week so that they can keep going for many weeks uh, because they're not getting paid for those, uh, those strike days. So they're doing that. They're uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, inconvenience to the public and at the same time a lot of the public is kind of uh, with them but also a lot of the public is with the government uh, because not necessarily supporting the government as a whole but kind of uh, being at least that's how the most of the press is reporting on it the public is not very happy with the government's uh, work but they were just elected a year ago, so they're still not in the grace period, but saying, all right, we elected them, let's see what they do, at least. But the big fear um, is that the transportation system in France becomes uh, too similar to the one in the UK, which is always <laughs> shown as where things didn't go right at all. And when they privatized the railway system, it, it incurred a huge amount of issues with uh, trains being delayed, some portions of the country not being served properly, etc., etc. So there's that example. On the other hand, uh, the telecommunications industry was uh, pr not privatized, but liberalized, I would say. Uh, private companies were brought in uh, maybe two decades ago, and that's worked out pretty well. Um, so I guess there is a way of doing it well, maybe in some areas, but people are very worried that it wouldn't be done well in the rail railway industry. And that is a, a big thing. Um, on the other hand, many governments have tried to reform the uh, that industry uh, for decades. And every time it's been impossible because the workers in the industry would block the country. Um, now it seems they're not getting as much traction as would be needed to make the government uh, fold. So it seems like it is going to go through, but we don't know. They're still on strike. They're still doing demonstrations, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the main story there. And I think maybe we can we could talk about it, but I really want to get your opinion on the other story from uh, a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago, which is what happened in the small town of Notre-Dame-des-Landes. And let me tell you uh, a little bit of background about this. The, the, the site is a site where a, a big airport was supposed to be built maybe 10 years ago. And that was a project that was, as always when you uh, try to, to build airports, I think there's always some opposition. And in this case, there was a lot of opposition, and the project was really difficult to get started and to put together. And a lot of people who were living nearby went and occupied um, the land where the uh, airport was supposed to be built to try and stop it. That was about 10 years ago when things started like that. There were demonstrations, recurring theme in France, demonstrations, etc., etc. Over time, because things were never really settled, um, a lot of people started actually living there. Uh, living there and developing some agriculture, raising cattle and uh, all manner of uh, of of beasts. <laughs> I mean, sheep and and I don't think they have cow, but they have sheep and goat and stuff like that. And it sort of developed into a uh, community of hippie hippie utopists, or they they basically. And again, here. A lot of people will, would characterize this situation differently than I will, and I apologize for that, but I, I'm trying to stay as neutral as possible, but of course, I, one can never be completely neutral, so please forgive me about that, but I'm going to try to give every side of the story. So they developed a community that was trying to uh, see what would happen if they would uh, try a different way, and when I say different, I mean different from capitalism and uh, the way society works today. But this started as a protest against the uh, airport being built. And so the occupation was in a zone à um, uh, défendre, which means zone to defend. And they were called Zad, Zadist. Uh, the Zadists <laughs> uh, were defending the zone against the airport slash capitalism slash our today's society that 
doesn't care about the fields and want uh, to to make everything uh, concrete, out of concrete and, and planes and fuel and all of that. Um, and so some of them have been living there for years and years. And now the project for the airport has been abandoned after a very long fight and a very long uh, uh, discussion, all of that, it lasted for almost 10 years, the project has been uh, abandoned. But the people who are living there don't want to leave. They have <laughs> been basically essentially squatting it, but they've developed their way of life almost now. Some of them have lived there for years and they don't want to leave. So you have this situation where some of the country considers this to be, uh, well, they're squatting. They, they, what they wanted has been achieved and they have to go away. So the government sent uh, the police, the riot police to take them out. There was some violence. Some people uh, went there just to fight against the riot police. There were some um, anarchists slash defenders of that Zad. Um, and th there have been a significant amount of uh, uh, rioting and fighting. It's been a big story, maybe even a big scandal. Um, some of the people who were living there uh, uh, did create, uh, not create, but they submitted projects to the administration to try and keep their, um, the, the way they were doing things. Some people are saying, but the administration is refusing everything that isn't traditional agriculture. And the administration is saying, well, the land has to be you know, used for agriculture. That's why why it's here. Some people are saying, yeah, but if you have, if you occupy a, a land for more than five or 10 years and it hasn't been used, then you are allowed to stay there. This is basically a law that um, allows people or that prevents people from not using a land they, they own uh, at all. Uh, so you have to actively get people out if they show up. But if they've been there for so long, then they can stay there legally. I don't know what the status of this one is specifically. Um, and then you have some people saying, but they, they just want to try something different. And they have this here and they want to they just want to try it. And why are we taking them away? Um, and the way I look at it is, you know, <laughs> well, maybe I'll ask you guys what, how you look at it, uh, first, um, let's try with Turkey for whom this must be somewhat foreign. <laughs> um, what do you think about this whole situation? What do you think, uh, people in Saudi Arabia would, would think about something like this, where people are occupying a a plot of land that is currently owned by the government because the previous owners were expropriated from it for the purpose of building the airport. So basically you're telling me to respond to something that happens here almost on a daily basis. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, how does it work there? Because, because in Saudi, uh, just basically... Any piece of land is government owned automatically. And then you have the problems. Uh, we have uh, different laws about take, uh, securing land. Uh, one of them is uh, Islamic law, Sharia law, where is, uh, if you take over a piece of land and you develop it and turn it like, uh, grow it, not develop it as in build it, but grow it and turn it into a farm or something, you have the right to claim that land for yourself, even if, if it's uh, government owned. And this is basically an Islamic law in Sharia. Uh, so a lot of people would go, and, and this is where the problem usually is. A lot of people uh, try to abuse this uh, Sharia law by going and picking up a piece of land and maybe putting two or three trees in it, or all palm trees in Saudi usually, and usually nothing else much else has been put in mm. there and then they go and try to claim that land and uh, transfer its ownership to them <laughs> okay which which is of course not what the sharia Allah is meant the sharia Allah basically meant that you actually develop it turn it into a farm that actually would benefit the community mm. and and that's yeah. a lot a loophole a lot of people have been using that the government has been uh, cracking down on uh, down on a lot 
so the concept of trying to and and Saudi is uh, specifically the big cities like Riyadh. It has a huge problem with the uh, land value, uh, basically because most land in Saudi is owned uh, in huge amounts by uh, very well-known specific individuals, whether businessmen, uh, uh, very influential families, or the royal family. And like, in re- and it's not like small pieces of land. Like they would have a piece of land that you could build, like for example, fifty or a hundred uh, homes on it, mm. and they would keep it. And a lot of these lands are never developed. Like if you come to Riyadh, then this is what you would find unique uh, in Saudi compared to some other developed countries is if you come in Riyadh, you would actually go to areas in Riyadh within the center of Riyadh, basically what we would consider the center of Riyadh. And you would still find huge pieces of land that are undeveloped as just empty land mm. there. Even though the entire area is developed, but those lands are just sitting there because those owners are refusing to develop them. Right. So I guess here and, and it's basically okay. they just want to sell it. Of course, yeah. Here it, there are some similarities. There are some uh, differences, of course. Um, one of the issues is that the, what they live in it has been built. It's not a shanty town quite, but it's not exactly. I wouldn't call it sanitary. Like, I'm not sure most of them, they don't have running water. Um, they don't have, like, it's when I was saying hippie, anarchist, uh, utopia, I think all of those words are apply. It's not, it, it's, it's just people who s- just got there and started building with planks of wood and uh, didn't worry so much about regulations and the way you should do things when you have like I don't they don't have um uh, uh I don't think there are many children in the community but if they did I don't know that where they would go to school maybe they go to the neighboring town or you know it's these kinds of of issues that become um problematic and I th- I, th- I think what's what's unique what's different in this story compared to what we're having in Saudi usually and we don't have this as much as here it's very rare that this happens in France apparently you this is this is a, a very well known land it's already known who owns it and it was supposed to be developed and then these are just people who try to stop the development so this is a different situation than the, what right. I was talking about and for us this in Saudi the, it doesn't matter what the people would think. The government would just go in and they're out whether they like it or not. If they yeah. don't like it, they get, they're they out of there directly to jail. End of story. Right, right. <laughs> and that's how it, it can't really quite work like this in France for many, many reasons. And there are genuinely a lot of people who, are saying, who, who don't know whether to think, well, they shouldn't be there because they don't have the right to be there, period. It's not their land, and they were there to prevent the building of the airport. The airport is not going to be built. What are they still doing there? Like, that that's the feeling of a lot of people in France. And I have to say, it's a little bit of... I, I, I understand the idea behind what they're trying to do, but at the same time, my, my and now I'm veering into my personal feelings, If if we allow this to happen, then it's kind of anyone can do whatever they want. And I'm, I'm. Isn't that morbid. a public land? Isn't that public land? Not really. That's it's my been, question. I, I mean, I don't know the exact specific details. Uh, I think it's owned by the Is state it? now, but it's it will okay. be redistributed for uh, agriculture, and they have yeah, been. Yeah, but that's agreeing- my point. That's my point. It it is a public land. If it's owned by the government, is by the state, then it's publicly owned by the entire people of that state. So why? What right does these individuals have to take this land without even consenting from the other people? Everybody has the right to that land. I think why should that's, you get it out of everybody else? And I think that the, that's the issue. One of the issues, and and the government has been trying to get some projects to be approved from some of the people that live there. But I suspect without knowing all of the specifics, I think there are a lot of very specific rules because, you know, that's how you do things because it's the law and and you can't just do whatever project you want. Um, And, and the people living there are saying, well, but they don't accept any project that's, that's common between many different people. They don't accept a com- commune kind of project, which, again, the idea, if they want to do that, my feeling is, 
Well, they can find another land where they would buy the land, own it, and live however they want. And even then, although if I'm being really honest, even then, the buildings have to be sanitary. You have certain rules for the way you build things. Like you can't just put four planks together and decide, well, this is a house now. This is where I'm going to live. I mean, you can be a crazy person in the forest, but and as one experiment, sure, maybe, but if you allow it once, then what prevents anyone else from doing this? Or what prevents what? the shanty towns from staying up? So, all right, let's go. Bart, I think you were trying to... Well, yeah, so okay. what occurs to me, so from the sanitary safety point of view, adults can make informed decisions and decide to live in places that are not safe. They can choose to make that choice. I would imagine there are children living here. And those children's rights are in, in France, I would imagine the, the children have a right to a safe environment to grow up and they have a right to go to school. They have also, you know, right to health care and stuff. So while the adults have made an informed decision that they're happy to take their chances in this, you know, improvised setting, those children, they didn't. So, so that I don't know that there are, things. I don't know that there are children that, now, that, and I don't know that if they were, they wouldn't go to maybe to school. So that would be taken care of. They would go to uh, healthcare as well, healthcare centers. So maybe that would be taken care of as well. Right, but if but your house sanitary wasn't and yeah. sanitary, your kid would be taken away. Like right, there right. would be a knock on your door, and your kid would be gone. And I would find that like how many people are we talking here? Hundreds of people, tens I of think people. It's a, few dozens, maybe a hundred, and there will be children at some point if they're allowed to stay. That's, you know, th there are oh, couples... That seems inevitable that are, to me, yeah, right? Yeah. You put more than two people together and usually a child <laughs> follows fairly soon afterwards. Oliver, you were trying to say something? Well, I think, uh, I mean, uh, these people are from the anarchist movement, right? So it's sort kind of, of point, yeah, some of them. It's sort of their point to um, not recognize those rules. Um, and and to and and part of the utopian um, uh, uh, idea is that they can start over. I mean, uh, and 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 not apply the traditional rules and not apply the laws uh, and not apply. Um, I mean, that's the whole point of this. So right. Uh, so but I think uh, I, you know. Um, you 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 probably won't um, you know argue with them and and get them to change their ideas and um, and their uh, demands by pointing out that they don't have sanitary um, they don't right. fulfill the sanitary rules of the building code um, You're I right. think you know, you know in Germany um, uh, uh, we do have things like that in Hamburg and Berlin where um, you know the leftovers from the uh, from the 70s uh, hippie movement uh, occupy a couple of buildings and mm. um, uh, and and for them, it's a a, a statement against you know the um, the, uh, the the society and um, and and capitalism and and so so I mean you you, uh, you can't come you know you can't tell them you know uh, there's a fire code uh, you have yeah. to make sure that <laughs> that those buildings are fireproof. They just uh, show you the finger, right? And um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's. I think, uh, yeah, I think there's some of that for sure, um, and I think a lot of people are. It, that's the argument that a lot of people are making in the country. They're saying, sure, they're not, you know, by the book, but just they're not hurting anyone. Just leave them there. They're just. And I think, as in isolation, this makes sense. But the problem is, if you start doing that, then. Why apply the, the the rules to other projects like this? And so, why so in in Germany, um, the um, you know uh, right wing parties that uh, sort of um, uh, you know bubble up a little bit or are on the uprise a little bit, um, who demand a stronger um, state, you know, a stronger um, government, um, and and you know more uh, totalitarian government. Um, they, um, for example, use the, these examples of occupied buildings, which are in Germany, they, those buildings are private owned. So they're not, you know, not public, 
uh, properties they are owned by you know uh, some companies that right. um, you know and and for over over years they they just let those people be because they they didn't know how to get rid of them so they said mm. okay let's just uh, let's just let them be before we have to kill them uh, we just <laughs> you know yeah because uh, you know ultimately if you want to um, if you want to uh, strong arm them, uh, there will be violence, and the violence isn't going to be pretty. And yeah, well, um, that's what's uh, happening you know, now in France. Yeah, so. and uh, but on the other hand, the political um, the, the, some people try to use that as political leverage and say, you know, if if we can't even, um, you know, um, uh, uh, police apply our, our laws and yeah. and. And, and police our own people, and then this means the government is weak, right? And right. Um, I think that's m even more the problem than those few people occupying the yeah. Um, I think those, those buildings. Yeah, there's definitely a political component in this case as well. Maybe the government was trying to distract people from the strikes and stuff like that, but. Ultimately, I think I, and many people will disagree with me in France, but I think I agree with the government here. It's like, yeah, it's not pretty. And yeah, they're not really hurting anyone. But if a decision has to be made, should we get them out or not? Well, I well tend to Patrick, think, I have well, a question with that, that sure. wording. Bart said uh, they're adults, they can do it. Uh, they know how to take care of themselves. You said they're not hurting anyone. But are they not hurting anyone in reality? So you're telling me they're living in non-sanitary Condition, so that means they could get sick easily. They could actually well, end up spreading diseases. They could okay. actually end up being sick. They're going to be treated at hospitals that are being t paid by tax. Uh, so payers let's in let's France. make sure let's well, make sure I'm clear here. They're still non-sanitary. I mean, they probably don't have running water, and but they're still clean. I'm guessing. You know, they're not. They don't have to drink water from the 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 un washed, I don't know, from the stream where others do put chemical waste or stuff like that. Like they they live in a in a hut in the forest, but some people live for a very long time that, in a hut that, in the forest. That's 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 we're assuming that's how they're gonna continue to live and it's only gonna be that number of people. Yeah. How do you no, know I agree, that, I agree. that the number is and that's, it's gonna turn into well, a shanky town, well, it's it's gonna have a disease, it's gonna have uh, security well, problems, disease problems, it's gonna spread, it's gonna infect every single individual <laughs> in that area. I wouldn't go that far. Well the, 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 the thing is the thing is uh 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 in in France and in Europe and in Germany, um those people are living in these conditions voluntarily. So it's not like a, a refugee camp where you cram in a lot of people and and, and all the people will go there and which I mean, we also of, have some I of mean, those most, by the way <laughs> mo most yeah but most of the uh, yeah not not like not like they have like in uh, in uh, in Turkey or in uh, of course of course but uh, it's, so, it's so pretty bad the, in the, France at least yeah. yeah but it's 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 still I mean it's still not I mean th these people right I mean uh, these people who live there and and protest um they are a very small group and they don't right. they're not going to be more and more and more because most people don't want to live that way um most people want to live in a in a proper house and sleep in a proper bed and have their running water and uh, you know have some sort of income and there's always going to be some you know extremists or people nonconformists um people who want things changed and want to change badly enough that they uh prepare to live in in, in such circumstances but i right. think th this group is not going to grow and uh if you look at the last 30 years um the, they actually have shrunk a lot so it's a lot less people willing to do that and uh, a lot more people um uh you know preferring the good way of life that we enjoy here and um so i think that's not a that's not a, a, a big right. concern i mean the, the thing you want to look at is how do we want as a society to treat those people um mm. are we gonna accept their different point of view and um make do somehow with um you know make arrangements make a compromise with them to allow them to um you know be like they want to and do we make room for them and do we accept that they occupied this area and move the 
uh, airport somewhere else or uh, I mean look at Berlin and you know how airports work and you, maybe we don't need the airport um, mm. so like I, yeah, I don't, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't guys, agree we, with that completely how, how, how cheap is it to live in France is it cheap no to find a house well, you, so well I mean it depends you, where if you, well, you want to go well, far from the cities yeah it might not be too expensive yeah if you, if, you, if you get a free land, you can just do that and you get free land. Would you not no, go no, for no, that you're not, you can't you're not, afford you're, paying for, for no, living? No, no, no. Yeah, this is, that this increases is, the number of people. All yeah, right. But let's, this is not, they, don't, they go, don't get to keep the land. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a way to acquire property. Um, well, <laughs> I, I don't know that yeah. it isn't, you know, it's, but okay, we, we've already spent maybe a little bit too much time on this it's a it's an interesting conversation for sure um hey patrick for once we're staying on a topic that's not the u.s related i know i know but i'm sure we're <laughs> gonna have other topics that aren't u.s related um i'll i'll move on i'm sorry but yeah we we we've already spent almost half an hour here um so but yeah my my opinion ultimately i think is I'm sorry, but this is not, this could lead to something not great. I understand not, you know, they're not hurting anyone, but, and it's the but that's important. Um, all right, Bart, what do you have yes. to tell us about? Well, the, the you know, the, the, the question you always ask us is, you know, what's happening in Ireland? Well, what's happening in Ireland is that we're getting ready for yet another referendum <laughs> on the thorny, thorny question of abortion, which... For as long as I have lived in this country, since 1984, has pretty much been a thing here. Um, so now we have a referendum which is being sort of known by everyone as repeal the Eighth, because the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution added in wording which effect was designed to stop abortion. Um, and that was done in 1983. Okay. And so it just said, the state acknowledges the right of life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect and, as far as practicable, by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. So basically, unborn children have rights and it's the government's job to protect those rights. But the mother has rights too. Hmm. And that's very, 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 very vague. <laughs> and everyone, there was much criticism at the time that this didn't really mean anything, but the Catholic Church put their weight behind it, and hey presto, it got voted in and it became part of the Constitution. So then the first time stuff went a little bit pear-shaped with it was in the late 80s, um, when the government started to take cases against people simply giving information about the existence of abortion in other countries. And they were charged with breaking the Irish Constitution. Really? Not, yeah, not to mention organizations helping women to travel abroad to get abortions. They, they came into like really big scrutiny. Okay. Uh, so, that, so they lost their case, and that made people angry. So they amended the Constitution again in 1992 to put in the 13th and 14th Amendments. They're just one sentence lines each. So the first one is, this subsection shall not limit freedom to travel between the state and another state. In other words, the right to life does not stop people traveling. So mm -hmm. there goes the whole, you can't travel abroad for an abortion. This subsection shall not limit freedom to obtain or make available in the state, subject to such conditions as may be laid down by law, information relating to services lawfully available in another state. In other words, it's not illegal to tell people about legal abortions in the UK. All right. Problem solved. What's, Problem what's, solved -ish. what's the issue now? Ish. <laughs> right. Then there was a, a very interesting case in 1992 where a, where a woman tried to go abroad for an abortion. The government tried to stop her. And her reasoning was, but my life is in danger. I am, you know, the, the, I was raped. This pregnancy has made me suicidal. I need this termination to save my own life. And that, that was the big scandal when I was in my young teens. It was called the X case. And then everything really kicked off four years ago. Sorry, not four. Actually, it was longer ago. It's 2012. God, it seems like only yesterday. Um, a, a, a woman of Indian descent went to hospital in Galway. She was pregnant. There was a really big problem and the baby died inside her and she needed it aborted. Or rather, the baby was definitely going to die and she needed it aborted and the hospital refused and she died from that. And oh, had wow. they performed an abortion, she would have lived, probably. And that, needless to say, 
got people very, very exercised. And since then, the momentum has been building towards this referendum, which is now coming up on the 25th of May. And that's going to repeal all of the law I just read. All of it gets removed from the Constitution and replaced by the shortest piece of legal language I've ever come across in my life. Provision may be made by law for the regulation of termination of pregnancy. Full stop. So it's okay to authorize abortion after that referendum? What it does is it takes it out of the Constitution and turns it into normal law. In other words, the Parliament can pass laws about abortion. So with the Constitution in the way, the Parliament cannot override the Constitution. So all Mm. they want to do is give the power to the Parliament. But the way stuff is being campaigned here on the on the no side, you would think that they were proposing the forced termination of every pregnancy ever. <laughs> right. I mean, they actually have posters up which make me extremely angry because they're flat. They're just bold faced lies. In the UK, one in five pregnancies end in abortion. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that, that cannot be true. Why can it not be true? I mean, it's. I'm sure it's not. One in five pregnancies end in abortion? That would mean millions of abortions a year. (laughs) Right. I mean, theoretically, it could be true, but obviously, yeah. Hmm. Um, Yeah, it's, I mean, this is interesting because in France, we've had for, I think, four decades now, one, two, three, four, five decades, maybe, four or five decades, uh, the right... uh, undisputable right to abortion. There is no question to be asked, no um, no discussion that you can mm. have. If a woman wants to have an abortion, uh, she just goes to a hospital or a clinic and she gets one. And so it's only, quote unquote, um, only for the first three months, which I was very surprised... Well, we- yeah, three months is 12 weeks. That's similar right. to what's been talked about here as when they when the parliament get the power to write a law, they are planning to write a law that says 12 weeks. So do you think it's likely that they will the it will be voted? Uh, yes. Uh, on? Until Brexit happened, I would have said probably because mm. every political party is in favor. Um, so it right. has mainstream support, just like that time we told Europe to get stuffed with the Lisbon referendum when every political party was in favor and the people voted no mm. anyway. Right. I, so, I, I wouldn't take a, I wouldn't take a bet. I, I genuinely have no idea. The people mm. who are against this will go out and vote. There is no doubt in my mind they will right. be at the polls. Will anyone else? So, in, yeah, what I did want to say is I think a lot of people in countries where there is a lot of um, anti-abortion sentiment have the impression that abortions can happen in that way much, much later in the pregnancy. Uh, I, I have Maybe I'm mistaken, and I'm thinking about the US because it's the most visible here, but there is a sentiment, I think, that abortions can happen, you know, way later, basically when the baby is much more developed. Um, three months in, it's a very, very small feat. It's still, uh, uh, you know, something hard. And I don't think any... I've ever, obviously I'm not a woman, I've never been directly confronted with that issue, um, so maybe we shouldn't discuss it too much, but I will say that living in a country where abortion is not an issue, um, I have never heard of anyone ever taking abortions not seriously. Abortion is always, always a trauma. It's always a problem. It's not something you do because, oh, I don't want to be pregnant today, you know? And and that, I think, is something that um, uh, anti-abortion people have a great fear of, that Mm. all of a sudden, if abortions were uh, authorized and easy, it would become a, a... Uh, something that is treated very lightly. And I can tell you, living in a country that's had it for many decades, it never is. It's always a trauma. It's it's never an easy decision. Um, So, yeah, that's that's what I can say about that. Um, Right. Right. What makes me particularly cranky, right? So I, I, like yourself, I'm not a woman either. So my sort of thinking is, It seems silly to think that a person isn't a person until they pop out of the womb. So clearly you don't become a human being at at nine months. So that's clearly silly. 
Right. But it's uh, also yeah. silly to say that you're a person at the moment the sperm touches the egg. So that's also silly. So somewhere in that gap, something special happens. And I really don't know where it is. And neither does anyone else. Right. So well, to me, uh, there's a real discussion to be had here about, you know, like there is a real argument to be had. But I'm not seeing a real argument had. What I'm seeing here is toxic, poisonous scaremongering at a colossal rate. And that's what has me the crankiest of all. Oliver, you wanted to uh, jump in? Well, uh, first of all, I think we should have a woman on this discussion first, <laughs> you know, for... I mean, um, yes, we and should. The other, thing, the other thing I wanted to point out was that it's... Um, I think it's 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 also instrumentalized um, this discussion um, to um, uh, basically suppress women, uh, and uh, and and that's that's kind of the um, the part of the discussion that um, uh, that's 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 fair, you know, that's very um, uh, what, what do I say. Um, it's. I mean, the, the the religious discussion always goes to, or the scientific discussion always goes to, um, you know, when does life start and when should it be protected? But um, the other part of this problem um, is not talked about in the same or given the same, um, you know, urgency or uh, uh, meaning uh, or. or um, um, significance uh a better word and that is the problem that uh in countries where abortion is legal um uh you know health uh, uh, children um children are healthier uh, women are healthier um uh, and um society is um you know uh, more educated and and you know and that's kind of a uh, you know, something that ha doesn't have to do anything with um, is a kid, you know, is, is a person, a person, you know, three months in, four months in, five months in. Um, it well, has to do I... with um, how do we how do we value, um, uh, you know, a woman's right over her own being uh, compared to. Uh, you know, the government's right to regulate this. Um, well, I mean, I, I think there is definitely a very strong argument to be made there. Uh, and absolutely in countries where abortion is legal, I mean, having abortion illegal is not, doesn't mean that you don't have abortions. And yes, we understand that problem and they might be very problematic uh, and very unsanitary and you will have death from, uh, you know, not, sanitary abortions and that's a pretty terrible it's just like pretending that uh, uh teaching abstinence means children are not going to have sex which i'm sure some listeners who are very christian are going to cringe at me saying this but unfortunately yeah, numbers you know tell you exactly the the, the opposite right it's like in, in those countries where um, or in those uh, societies where abs uh, abstinence is um, preached, uh, there's a, a higher level of child pregnancies. Pregnancy, um, yeah. and, uh, um, but, but I do, but of, I do want to yeah. get back to the question of whether or not a, a person is a person, you know, into some at some point into the pregnancy, because if you determine that you know at five months a baby a, a fetus is a person then an abortion becomes murder. You know, that is a very serious and it's the core of the entire issue. So I, I'm sorry, Oliver, but I disagree with you that this is not, uh, um, the, you know, it's not the main topic. Others topic. Other topics are important as well. But this is the, I think, the most important one. Because if you decide or determine somehow that, or, or, or think that a baby, a, a, a fetus is a person then, yeah, as I said, uh, uh, an abortion well, is murder. So enough, that like, it, like it cascades look, into everything else. If you look uh, into the United States, where this issue is probably the most uh, controversial, I don't know what's in Ireland, but, um, you know, the Americans generally don't have a problem with terminating someone's life. Um, you know, <laughs> this, uh, they And they that's a whole other people, discussion, you know? but yeah, I agree. So, yeah, 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 but that's like, what, what's the difference between, you know, um, you know, killing someone for, you know, a crime they committed? Um, well, know, the fact that they've been proven guilty. 
I well, think that's a very you clear know, but, distinction. Uh, you know, if you if you if you value life um, so much, then um, I don't think there's a I, difference. I disagree with the sentiment, but I understand the fact that if you have a, a, a life that hasn't even really started yet, it's different from. And I'm not for uh, the death penalty, so that's not my sentiment. But it's true that someone that has been proven guilty is different, in my opinion, from. You know, or in their opinion, then. But that's a whole different. I mean, pretty soon we're going to get to. That's a whole other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Turkey. How, how, what is? I'm guessing that uh, even thinking about abortion uh, essentially is blasphemy in Saudi Arabia. Nope, that's where you're completely wrong. Oh, really? <laughs> all right. Tell us all more. Right. First of all, first of all, let me. There's no laws. All right. And my information is very limited, so bear with me. The concept of abortion is all based on Islamic law purely. There's no actual law in Saudi regarding this matter. Mm -hmm. And according to Islamic law, uh, a baby is, does not have a soul uh, until he's uh, until the pregnancy is at least three months or five. I'm not exactly sure, but let's say three months. So at least three months. At the end of the three months period, that's when a baby has a soul. Then that that's when the baby becomes an individual. Okay. So, so if, during the first three months, religiously, there's nothing against abortion because you're not killing anybody. So does that mean that a woman can get an abortion if it's before the first the the, the three months into pregnancy? Uh, it depends on the doctor. If she finds the doctor, that would do it. Okay, but it's not illegal. Uh, there isn't a law that as far as it. far as I know. I could be a hundred percent wrong, but this is okay. as far as I know. But there isn't like Manal, Manal isn't sitting here, so I can ask. Her, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there isn't yeah. like there aren't yeah. scandals every every few months or years saying, "Oh, this person tried to get an abortion mm -hmm. and it's horrible." No, no and, this is the problem yeah. with abortion, and when we're talking about abortion, and usually in uh, societies where abortion happens, it's usually when a couple isn't married. That's the the majority of abortions usually happen. Mm. All right. So here, legally, you're not even have, supposed to have sex. So women here don't, their problem isn't getting the abortion. It's actually finding someone that they can have an abortion without anybody else knowing they had an abortion. Right. Because it's so, not about pregnant. It's about they actually had sex outside of the bond of marriage. Right, right. I see. All right. So, so, so this is where the problem is for women here. Mm. And, so, and that's why a lot of them end up having abortions uh, in a very unhealthy environment, either within Saudi, very uh, secretly and maybe unprofessional ways or going abroad and doing it. And some usually they go to very poor countries like and uh, very unsanitary ways to do it. Mm. OK, because they're now, trying to hide the fact that they had sex before marriage. Yes. Now, for w married women, Islamic law says Uh, the, uh, it's okay in general before the th first three months. And as far as I know, if the health of the mother is in danger, then abortion is okay. Mm. If it's to save the mother's life. So I guess in that regard, uh, it's very similar to France because we also have the first 12 weeks uh, rule. So quite surprised. <laughs> Didn't realize. Um, all right. Anything else anyone wants to add about this topic before we move on? I guess uh, we're done. Let's talk about Saudi Arabia, Turkey. What's been happening with this crazy magical storm? <laughs> well, we've been having some crazy weather this month. Uh, we've having we had had I think right now three huge sandstorms. Uh, usually known internationally as whoop. Okay, whoop. And, That's... and whoop, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's followed by, and this is the interesting part, it's not purely just sandstorm, it's sandstorm followed by extreme monsoonic rain. Mm. Ooh. So, so, the, so you, you sent so me a... You end up first with dirt. Yeah, you saw the, the video. <laughs> yeah, you sent me a video before we started. And when I was joking about the uh, Mad Max Fury Road grade sandstorm, it, it's not a joke. It's literally a giant wall of, of uh, sand 
coming at a very fast pace towards the city. And it's it's yes. terrifying. Like it's like a, a I don't know, a, a twister or something. Well, we you, had you, three you, this month. So what do you do? You like barricade yourself and then don't go out until the mansoonic rain has stopped or? I know people usually just go along normally. Uh, th there are, of course, some things that change. Uh, usually schools shut down be just to for the children because of uh, s safety and so on. Uh, s some go some businesses might shut down. So it really comes down to individuals and uh, the needs because mm. it's it's not that very uh, strange. It's for not us. so destructive, is it? Is it destructive? No, okay. not usually, especially in a city like Riyadh. It's not that destructive because Riyadh is very well developed and it's very clustered. So it doesn't affect you that much when it hits you. Now, small towns, yes, they do get very destructive usually when it hits small towns. So it, it definitely hits some towns where it really hurt them. So what happens, what happens afterwards, uh, once the storm has passed, is the, the government or the local administration in charge of cleaning it up or just the rain just wash it away or... Oh, usually, it depends on the situation. For the, these last three, they were followed by monsoon rain. And usually, so you start with the very dirty air, then turns into mud, and then it turns into just clean rain. Ah, so it cleans itself. Usually, yes, mostly. It cleans most of the stuff. Mm. Okay, so it's and not such the, a big deal. You have, uh, I was, I like, feel let down, Turkey. I was a little bit lied to. I was expecting, like you know, uh, uh, cars chases and and uh, some kind of barbaric, uh, uh, I don't know, thundering thing coming out of the sandstorm. Well, I'm, I'm a bit well, disappointed. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure we had some of that with some of these crazy <laughs> teens when they go out to the desert and decide to play with the sandstorm. Yeah, I'm sure we have some of those. Okay, all But right. If I find if I find video, I'll send you. <laughs> <laughs> you mean of of kids going out with the cars and being crazy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so but so, yeah, but the, but this time it's it's it, and the rain was so much we had, the roads turned into rivers, running rivers. All right. Oliver, you <laughs> wanted to add something? Yeah, so um one interesting thing is we also get uh, uh sand from the deserts in uh, Africa uh, here um and uh, in Germany? Uh, Yes, uh, the uh, the sands travel um, all the way from the Sahara, um, which is not the same um, uh, desert that uh, uh, um, that uh, Turkey lives in, but uh, it's uh, it's around the same distance, and uh, the sand Wait, travels I'm... all the way to. Uh, to to Germany. I'm looking at the the map. I'm like, did did I not know where Germany is? <laughs> <Because, laughs> yeah, uh, I we we never have those in France. It's weird. Yeah, yeah it's uh, we we uh, we get it, uh, and and uh, when you go outside and you park your car outside, it's actually covered in uh, in, in in very fine uh, yellow uh, dust. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's that. Sometimes that's uh, sand from the Sahara. Mm. Maybe maybe they get it in the south of France, but I don't know how it would travel from like all the way across, like I don't know, Italy all the way to Germany. But you are in the south of Germany, so um, yeah. <laughs> the, so second it question: actually, to, it, it oh. traverses the Alps, so it's it's uh, it it gets up into very high. Um, uh, high up in the atmosphere, and then it travels all the way, and then it rains down mm. or falls down in, uh, in in Munich on your head. In Munich, yes. <laughs> um, okay, second thing, Turkey. I'm only half joking about this Infinity War thing. Uh, I think I ask you every time there's a big uh, movie, a blockbuster that comes out, but now you have like movie theaters, and men and women have the right to go together, and that's new. I, I think, right? I'm not mistaken? Well, kind of. Okay. <laughs> It's families only. Ah, right now. okay. So if you're, okay. But so I so guess... you're a single guy, you can't go. <laughs> or, oh, you can't go if you're a single guy at all. Yes. Oh. Well, at the moment, at the theater that's already open, there's only one theater open at the moment. Mm. So, But I guess the single guy could go with his parents or... Yes. Yes, right. as long as he has a female companion, which is supposed to be a family member. Okay. 
But I assure you, I'm sure some of them are taking their girlfriends and they're just... Oh, she's my sister. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so what do people in Saudi Arabia think about these movies? Well, we all, there's only been two movies up till now. But there is uh, Infinity War that came out, right? Yeah, you have Infinity I, War and Black Panther. Those are the only two until now that came out. Oh, the only two and movies said, that came out, none other? Because it's one theater. I know, but right. I mean, There's it's been, one it's that been two months. Okay, and it's one one theater, one month, like with one, one room month, only? No, it opened on April 18th. Oh, I didn't realize. I yeah, didn't realize April it was, it was okay. so so late. I thought it had been open for, for two or three months. Um, no, no, so no, how, no, no. How's it, how has it been April going? Late. Uh, it's been, uh, as far as I can see, it's been very popular, but let's see how long it lasts. Mm. Are you afraid? It's something unique, something new. Are you afraid some, uh, the, the religious authorities will pressure people to? No, 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 no. I'm to... talking about the popularity, ah. how, how long the popularity will last. Okay. No, there's a second movie theater, I think, uh, which is a real movie theater uh, in a big mall and so on. I think it will open in a couple of weeks. So I think that's going to be the real test. The current movie theater, they converted a convention center in the financial district into a movie theater. Ah, okay. But so I guess, I mean... It's not really a movie theater in a way. But you've had all of those movies via, you know, uh, uh, TV and, and online services, I'm guessing, already. So it's not like people are discovering the MCU with... Uh, with Infinity War, which would be very confusing. You, you've already seen all of those movies and others, of course. I'm c focusing on the MCU. Well, uh, the, all the, War. yeah, yeah. When when they come up on DVDs and so on, or uh, right. streaming services, a lot of people have access to streaming services. A lot of people have access to DVDs and so on. Um, it's it's the frustration people always had was go, going to a movie as soon as it's out. That's you don't have access to usually. Of course. And and now you have the theaters coming in, but. At the end of the day, it's uh, the movie is going to be censored for sure. Okay. So depending on what type of movie you're going to see, God knows how much they're going to cut out of it. So definitely, a romantic movie would have at least half of it cut. I'm assuming. <laughs> Because so what what kind uh, of thing would they cut out? Is it like every scene that wouldn't fit in in Saudi Arabia? Like if you have men and women out at a, f a restaurant, that would be cut or? No, I would think stuff like kissing mm. would be cut. Uh, uh, nakedness, uh, half-naked bikinis, those are going to be cut most likely. Um, uh, I think anything that's very religious, Christian or Jewish, uh, very religious might be cut. So it really comes down to the movie. For example, Black Panther didn't have much. I think there was a single kiss in the entire movie, and that was cut. So they're like the Black Panther only got like 40 seconds cut out of mm. it, as far as I know. Probably about the uh, same Infin in uh, in Infinity War. Yeah, yeah. Infinity War is would be the same, but there are movies that are gonna be drastically cut down uh, in a way, and uh, so you have that thing, and all the movies will be subtitled. Of course. Yeah, so it really comes down to what do you enjoy, what do you like, and what are you looking mm. for. For example, I would never go to the theater that's open right now. Well, I won't go to theater period in Saudi anyway. But this Why? one specifically I won't go because, because of the sound system. It's not actually a theater sound system. Mm. It's a convention center. I'm not paying. And it's not that cheap. Uh, uh, tickets start at 75 reals, which is around $20. Mm. No, but you said you would never go in the theater in Saudi anyway. So, why? My experience are uh, Saudis are very annoying in theaters. Ah, <laughs> I've experienced okay. When I go abroad in Dubai or Bahrain, when I go to a theater, so they're yeah, they're so noisy I, and just like Americans. Yeah. then I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, I I wouldn't know. When I was in the states, I usually go during the time that nobody's going noon or <laughs> Good something. Good call. <laughs> so so empty empty theaters. I went. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, last, really, last question. Like, seriously, what do Saudi think about the crazy Marvel stuff with, like, the, the cosmic universe of Marvel with the Guardians of the Galaxy and Thanos and all of this? Is it even a topic of conversation or is it just, oh, that's science fiction, whatever? Or do they think, oh, the Americans are crazy? Or I'm just 
you know, the, the West is, is this is corrupting the minds of our youth or I'm genuinely curious. No, it's, it's not any different from different from other countries like the States or I'm assuming France or so on. So you have different types of people. You have the geeks who have been talking about it like crazy and discussing it and looking forward mm. to it. Okay. You have the some of the extremists who think, oh, this is disgusting. This is American influence. This is stupid, blah, blah, blah. Right. So and those then you have we the normal really people. Have, but yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then you have the normal people who just yeah, think it's Yeah, the normal people who... Yeah, there's a movie they might want, they might be interested in watching, they might enjoy okay. it. And those who think, nah, I don't like it, I'm not interested. So, yes, yeah, so, so you have all types of people. But you do uh, have it, the it, geeks it, that are that have been looking forward to it for a long time oh, and yeah, that know oh, the yeah, comics yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, we have we have a lot of geeks in Saudi. Uh, we don't have any less geeks than any other country. We have loads <laughs> of geeks. So, and it's Fair very enough. popular with a lot of people. I've, at least the people, for example, in my Twitter feed, there was a very good coverage from a few Saudis that I followed about it and looking forward to it. So, yeah, all I right. have all of that. And we have wrestling. What? Did you, have, did you hear about wrestling? No. What do you, you mean? Know the WWE? American do you have wrestling? like the, the Saudi WWE? That show, w, WWE? Yeah, 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 of course. WrestleMania? I do. Yeah, the Saudi government have brought them here to do a show, and they called it the greatest WrestleMania ever. <laughs> so it is or, the or WWE. Like, it's not like some kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. Saudi. No, no, no. It is yeah, WWE, right, okay. and I, I think it's the greatest Royal Rumble. Nice. Well, I know a few yeah, people they had in the it audience. Yesterday, will be happy I think. About. Was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. Cool. And it all was right. broadcast live all over the world. <laughs> Well, I'm telling you, Saudi Arabia is opening up to, you know, to great things from the West. And now we have proof. Well, uh, there's, there's other things I would... Uh, this is, these are all in the bottom of the list that I would have loved to see happen here. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, all right, <laughs> let's go for our last uh, section. Let's go to Oliver and what's been happening in Germany. Well, um, uh, originally I think I thought I would uh, probably talk about um, uh, Chancellor Merkel's visit to Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. but, oh, uh, sorry, actually, uh, let me interrupt. Uh, in the last episode, uh, we were discussing uh, Ange Angela Merkel, and we got the her time in power completely wrong, and many many people. <laughs> Uh, sent us uh, corrections about the fact that she had been in power for only, what is it, 12 or 13 years, um, and not what whatever we said at the time. So apologies so, so for I that. Think it's it's her, first, uh, her for, fourth um, um, term, so right. it, it would be a year uh, uh, 13 through 16. So Exactly. So there yeah. you go. Um, and, and apologies for that. There we many people have let us know that we were mistaken and we appreciated every single one of them uh right so sorry you were going to talk about her her visit to the u.s yeah but... i was i was but but yeah i think it's you know the topic of the united states is always triggering a lot of discussion so maybe <laughs> um maybe you should uh do something else um oh, well, that's what happens when, when 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 that's what happens when the u.s elect uh, an orange baboon to lead them <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apparently this time the the visit uh, went a little different from what uh, happened a year ago uh, when she first went to Washington and uh, focus on uh, in the German press is of course on the handshake um, which mm. didn't happen last time and which happened this time and which is widely viewed as an improvement uh, <laughs> and I think that uh, sort of tells you everything you need to know about this. Um, <laughs> they they uh, shook hands. It's getting hands. better. Yeah. So it's, actually, it's... Um, Macron, our French president, was in the US also during the month, and he actually kissed uh, Trump on the cheek. And well, uh, as as we sometimes do in, in France, and I'm sure in other countries, but apparently that was a big topic of conversation as well, because yay. he had a firm handshake and he also kissed him on the cheek. And there was kind of a, a, a little gay. bit of <laughs> gay. <laughs> well, not necessarily, but, you know, there's nothing wrong well, about a little bit of you, you uh, do, manly uh, Patrick, uh, you, attraction. Patrick, Patrick, you do know that's how we greet each other in Saudi, right? Oh, really? No, I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So now you know. 
Um, yeah, that's. I, I think that's uh, also one of the things that uh, occupies the German press in this uh, regard is, of course, uh, the comparison to Macron and uh, ah. sort of, uh, you know, the Germans and the French are currently in a sort of um, competition over who has more influence in Europe and, uh, of course, um, both try to, um, uh, you know, uh, sway Donald Trump in into their camp. And uh, um, Angela Merkel certainly did have uh, the disadvantage um, because uh, Macron invited uh, Donald Trump uh, to the last year to the uh, parades, and he liked that very much. And so he's a <laughs> he's a good friend of Macron now. And uh, Angela <laughs> Merkel is. Um, sort of like a sideshow um <laughs> well sadly she she can't really officially show uh trump the the how's it called the defense force of of the german uh, people that wouldn't be viewed as as very well across europe but uh, i'm curious well, I, I, and, and also apparently uh as according to our defense uh, minister they are not very presentable at the moment so ah. Uh, the the, uh, the Americans um, insisting on uh, increasing defense budget for the Germans um, uh, might have a point uh, if you look at the military as some sort of uh, indicator of how well your company uh, how your country is doing. Uh, I think if you look at Germany, um, uh, we can we can do without uh, shiny military uh, things, and uh, I would yeah. I would uh, I would uh, you know my way of uh, increasing the defense budget would be to add the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the foreign aid budget to the defense budget because it uh, it's certainly better invested money to <laughs> send you know um, to uh, uh, build schools in uh, uh, in uh, adversary countries. Um, uh, than to send military there, but um, you know, I think that's just a, a lot of a lot of people in Europe would agree that you know what, if the 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 German don't call it an army, uh, the German uh, defense force is is not super powerful, that's not too much of a problem. Let's keep it. That, you that's know, not too bad, everyone yeah. is in Europe would be like, yeah, yeah, we're, it's fine, it's that's fine. A good it's idea. Not, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I think I think uh, Europe uh, um, should have a uh, joint force, and uh, ah, away, you're you're one of those with the local do away with the local military, um, and uh, th I think that that would be a very good idea. I'm um, very much a pro-Europe person. I'm not sure this would this wouldn't be the first step I would go to. I think I think there are a lot more, many many other things. Uh, we need to build up Europe it's, before it's, we, we do it's, that. It's the uh, uh, it's the easiest, actually. I think because uh, yeah. the military uh, command structures are very similar. They already um, operate under NATO uh, in sort of a, a, a you know a coordinated um, command structure. Uh, so I think it, it um, in you know, all but practical terms, um, in all it would practical be, I'm terms, sure, yeah. well, it's already, it's already uh, you know, it's already the way it is. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. We're uh, a fly in your ointment, unfortunately, because being officially neutral, Ireland sticks its foot in whenever anyone suggests any sort of military at an <laughs> EU-wide level. We, we, we just pull our veto out and go, nope. No, yeah. and I think I think it has, yeah, it could be done practically, but I think it has other implications that many, many people in, in Europe are not ready to accept. And I have, even That's me, true. I'm not sure I would, I would, I mean, I could be convinced, but I'm like, eh, maybe that's not the first thing we should do. But um, I, we mentioned the, the Macron-Merkel rivalry with the French-German uh, rivalry, which of course heated up when uh, the UK decided to butt out of Europe. It meant that there could be room for a new leader, which had been Germany until now, but France could could claim that, uh, that uh, throne. And I'm wondering what image Germany has of Macron uh, in, in general, because in France, the image is not great, but it seems to be pretty good everywhere else. How is he seen in, in Germany? Uh, I think uh, largely favorable. Uh, it's uh, he is a, a young, energetic uh, guy, um, and I think that is 
um, something that's uh, fresh and new in the political scene. Um, if you know, uh, we've uh, uh, you know, uh, Merkel is often uh, portrayed as, uh, you know, Germany's uh, mom. And so uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's sort of an elderly person that you look up to, but, um, you know, you, you respect, but you don't, you, you know, don't le- necessarily think, uh, uh, you know, um, necessary. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, I, like, I see what you it's, mean. It's a, it's a very, uh, you know, the, your relationship to your parents is, you know, uh, is a very uh, <laughs> complicated. You, think, you know, it's it's a very good model for what's actually going on because because you you think you know um, you like them and you you respect them and and you don't don't want to miss them but you you think they really belong to a different universe right mm. so uh, they are the old people and um you know um you know they you they are not usually the first people you go to if you have a new idea you go to them if you run into trouble and um, right that's that's how Angela Merkel runs uh, Germany most uh, most of the time is you know uh, you know fixing the trouble and not really <laughs> uh, going out and finding new uh, exciting stuff to do um, mm-hmm. and and uh, I think uh, Macron is, is seen uh, as as more of the you know um, young you know, dynamic young dynamic uh, you know um, forward looking you know in, you know innovative kind of leadership um, yeah it, it's funny the yeah. um a lot of his ethos you know he's he's supposed to be the guy who will make france into the startup nation and that's been a recurring theme in his uh communication and a, a lot of people kind of make fun of that and use the startup nation as a uh a way to make fun of his party and some of the things he's doing like oh look this is the startup nation president ha 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 and uh, i i think it's there's some unfairness there there's some fairness but yeah he definitely has this image of uh i'm young and dynamic and we're gonna do everything super cool and at the same time um some people mock that part of his image which is fair i'm sure but um all right I guess that is uh, going to be it. Does anyone have anything else to add before we close out the show? I think that's about it. Uh, Thank you very much to all three of you for being on with me. Uh, Before we leave, would you mind telling uh, the listeners where they can find you online on Twitter, of course, and if you have other things you do, let's start with Turkey. Well, you can find me on Twitter, of course, at Turkey Albala, T-U-R-K-I-A-L-B-A-L-L-A. And you can follow my occasional posts. And I'm going to Sri Lanka on Monday, so maybe you'll see some photos from there. Oh, cool. Excellent. Um, uh, Did you see Infinity War or not? No. No, you didn't because you didn't go to a theater. Okay. No. Um, Okay. Bart, what about you? Uh, well, no one can spell my Twitter handle, which is bboushot. <laughs> so how's about I say to go to my website at bartb.ie, where you'll find links to Twitter and Flickr and all that kind of stuff. And if you want to listen to the podcasts I do, you'll find those at let's-talk.ie. There are two monthly shows, Let's Talk Photography and Let's Talk Apple. Excellent. And you will have the link to the Twitter account in the show notes as well. Uh, Oliver, what about yourself? Well, if you want to find me on Twitter, it's at Oliver Breiden, at, at O Breidenbach, actually, without the Oliver. So O Breidenbach, uh, B-R-E-I-D-N-B-A-C-H. Link and, will be in the uh, show notes as well. Yes, yes, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you uh, want to learn more about Boeing Software, it's at B-O-I-N-X dot com. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's B-O-I-N-X dot com. Excellent. Uh, for me, it's not Patrick on Twitter and on Facebook. You can find, oh, if you go to my uh, Facebook or Instagram page, it's not Patrick there as well. You will find the photo of the cutest baby in the world, uh, which is my baby. You know, it's it's very strange. <laughs> I, it was it, there was it was one in a billion chance that we would get uh, my wife and I the cutest baby in the world. It's super weird, but we did uh, get him. Okay, so okay, 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 it's, okay, it's Patrick. Very wait, strange. wait, wait, you have to. You have to explain this to me. Okay. You have to explain to me. 
So I see the photos, and this is the cutest, most adorable baby. Okay. Thank then you. I go to your so you Twitter confirm, account, you and I think. Then, then I go to Twitter account, and I think he's the devil when I read your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to explain this. Um, well, this is the duality of parenthood. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure that at some point you will uh, experience it as well. And then you will understand. But really, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, um, there are two types of people in the world. There are uh, parents who had a semi-difficult to difficult baby. Ours wasn't super difficult, but he was a little bit difficult. Uh, now it's getting a lot better. But um, so... I think I'm in kind of that category. There are a lot of people who have much more difficult babies, which my heart goes out to them. And the other category of people in the world is uh, people who don't have babies and people who have easy babies, who I assure you do not understand at all what the other category of people <laughs> goes through. Um, so, and and they they might do a few comments like, Ah, yeah, it's it's really hard when the baby doesn't sleep or when he cries a little bit, and you're like, "Don't talk to me. You don't know. You don't. You <laughs> you think you do, but you don't." Um, so it's yeah, and that's impossible to explain. Um, he's getting cute now. We chose a good moment for the picture, but now it's really really nice. Um, it was not. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, I can't remember if I said this in the show before, but there's an expression in French, uh, in French, which says, it's only happiness. And uh, it's just an expression. And so you say, you know, oh, you'll see it's a little bit hard, but it's just happiness. It's only happiness. And I want to turn around to those people and tell them, no, it is not. <laughs> it, it really isn't. Like there is very little happiness in those first two months when you have a baby that cries all the time. Very little and even that happiness is like, you, 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 I'll do a baby special at some point. I think it will be cathartic, but um, yeah. But yeah, that, that picture I think is possibly the, the cutest baby picture ever. He's so cute. Oh, look at him. I went to look at him. Um, all right. So not Patrick on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of those things. You can find the show at frenchspin.com. You'll also find uh, a show about video games in general uh, at that uh, at address. It's actually called Pixels. It's easy to find in your podcast app. And I recently did a special about God of War awesome game that came out a week ago or two. No, just one week ago. And uh, I talked about it for about half an hour without any spoilers. So you can go check that out if you're interested in games. And uh, lastly, you can go to pat patreon.com slash the Phileas Club and support the show financially. The show doesn't have any sponsors or uh, third party support. It only exists because the listeners decide uh, to support it. And the listeners are you listening now. So if you think the show is fun, gives you a little bit of insight on something, is a little bit different from what you always uh, hear, and you think it would be good for it to continue, then please do consider going to patreon.com slash the Phileas Club. The link is in the show notes. It takes about a couple of minutes to create an account if you don't already have one, although I suspect many of you already do because there are so many cool podcasts and other things to support on Patreon. So uh, yeah, if you enjoy the show, please do think about this for... Uh, uh, you know, a couple of seconds, think maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't uh, weigh the good and bad about supporting the show financially. That would be awesome. And I thank a million times all of the people who do support it already and whom I love dearly uh, almost as much as I do my adorable little baby. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that's it for us. We will be back for the next episode in a few weeks. Talk to you then. Bye. Bye.